Chris Hill, why not? Uh, before you leave, it'd be very helpful uh, overall. Uh, next paper uh, is uh, by uh, Joe Joseph and Don uh, Hahnemann uh, from uh, Amico Corporation. And the title is A Short History of the Amico Corporation. for uh, inviting us uh, for this uh, presentation. <laughs> um, Amoco uh, has a history of over 115 years and it's very difficult to uh, compress uh, more than a century of uh, uh, events into uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, uh, but I'll certainly give it a try. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the genealogy of Amico. This is important because uh, in the um, history of uh, mergers and acquisitions, it's very difficult to keep track of when a company was formed and when it ended. Uh, both Don and I will be talking today. Uh, I will be talking about the oil side, and Don will be talking about the uh, chemical side. I will be talking about the refining, uh, marketing, and oil exploration part of Amico. And uh, in about 10 minutes, Don will take over. Amoco was born on June 18, 1889, as Standard Oil Company of Indiana, as the uh, Whiting Refinery. This is on the lakes of, uh, on the shores of uh, Lake Michigan, a little bit um, uh, southeast of Chicago. Its parents were John D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Trust. But unfortunately, in 1911, the poor thing got orphaned because of the uh, breakup of the, uh, the trust, thanks to um, Ms. Ida Tarbell. And of course, in the event of uh, a being, it got married to a Pan American oil company, which actually changed its life forever. In that marriage, Amoco uh, or Standard Oil, Oil of Indiana got enormous amount of wealth. It, had, it got 1.5 million acres of oil fields in Mexico, 3 million acres of oil fields in Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. You should realize that at that time, nobody really explored for oil in the lake or in the water. But for some reason, Pan American had the vision uh, by whatever reason, they thought there would be oil under the, under the lake, under the water in the lake. Uh, it also got uh, refineries in Mexico, Venezuela, Germany, Maryland, not too far from here, Baltimore, Georgia, and uh, Louisiana. And it had the largest tanker fleet in the world for transportation of crude and also had marketing operations in Europe, South and North America. And most importantly, which is very significant to later on to Amico, uh, was a 50% interest in the American oil company of Baltimore. This company was owned by a family called Bluffton family. And the uh, influence of this family was tremendous on the future workings of uh, Standard Oil of Indiana or Amico. Well, I mentioned a couple of significant events. Uh, uh, in 1933, uh, it bought the rest of American Oil Company and uh, its Amoco brand. And the, the, the company eventually, uh, Standard Oil, changed its name to uh, uh, Amoco Corporation in 1984. In 1988, in the search for uh, oil reserves, went and bought uh, Dome Petroleum Company of Canada. Uh, in 1998, that work came to an end. Uh, Amoco merged with British Petroleum and assumed a new name. It's called BP. And BP went on to uh, acquire Arco and Castro. And in uh, 2002, uh, BP acquired uh, 
German outfit called Faber Oil, and it's a marketing amp called Norad. And in 2003, uh, it acquired a company called TMK or TMK. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure which one is it, N or M. But it's a Russian oil company in which uh, both BP uh, and Amco are invested quite a bit. By the way, the pictures I see, I show, uh, uh, the one on the top is uh, Mr. John Swearingen, uh, who had a profound influence on the, uh, 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 in the life of Amoco, converting into uh, a, a U.S. major oil company. And the one in, at the bottom is Mr. Larry Fuller, who presided over the uh, merger uh, with BP. And I want to go back to something I forgot to mention. Uh, this gentleman, Colonel Stewart, in those days, everybody was a colonel for some reason. And uh, he uh, actually was uh, a person who grew Standard Oil of Indiana from a fledgling refinery into a, a major power in the Midwest, both as a refining as well as a marketing uh, power in the oil industry. Um, today, uh, the merged company, Amoco BP, uh, has several uh, Brands is a beep at the bottom, uh, the BP, the Arco, the Castro, the Royal, and I don't know how TMK looks. Let's talk about refining and marketing. As I said earlier, <coughs> Standard of Indiana was established, uh, established as a refinery uh, in Whiting, Indiana. The purpose was to refine a very sour Ohio crude. How sour uh, was this, this crude? In those days, <coughs> refining crude was to generate kerosene or heating oil primarily, and some, you know, lighting oil also was, uh, uh, was there in the mix. But the major product, kerosene, produced from this uh, Ohio crude was called poor cat oil or skunk juice, mainly because the, the, the horrific order of hydrogen sulfide that comes with, during the processing. Now, therefore, this crude oil was extremely cheap. It was, you know, you could get it for, for the asking. Now, Rockefeller you know, was a very visionary person, as you all know. Uh, he thought there is money in that, in the scum juice. So, and he had um, uh, uh, at his disposal, I don't know who invented this, but what's called the fresh process, to take care of the sulfur uh, in the crude oil. Uh, it basically was uh, trying to get rid of sulfur or hydrogen sulfide by reacting with copper oxide, where, uh, where the copper would capture the sulfur and turn into copper sulfide, and uh, lo and behold, you know, you get uh, saleable products. And that was the intent of uh, uh, starting this company in, in uh, Whiting. Uh, yeah, true, uh, the, the purpose of uh, uh, starting a company is one, but uh, what really made the company was the uh, thermal hacking process by Burton and Humphreys. Uh, I don't know, UOP says they, like, they had claim to this process, but I think it's for lawyers will settle that somehow, or might have settled. I'm not going to go into that. But um, it's still known as the Burton Humphrey uh, thermal hacking process. It actually revolutionized the petroleum industry in the sense that now we are able to make more. Um, liquid fuels or light fuels uh, from um, uh, any heavy crude. That was a success. And more importantly, the minor product, which was called gasoline at that time, which was uh, uh, sold for operating a few automobiles here and there, now more gasoline came. That uh, actually was the start of a major revolution in the US, uh, major revolution in the world that is mass production of automobile, because now gasoline was available. Uh, well, this, this process was a huge success for Standard of Indiana. It brought $11 million as royalty between 1919 and 1924. And that was that big. I have this picture here. I don't, I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's an old picture, as you can see. Uh, the sky there is as black as the ground, you see. Uh, 
Obviously, EPA didn't exist at that time. Uh, but I suspect this is probably a series of burden stills. Uh, there were hundreds of these stills on, on the Whiting uh, refinery site. This, uh, this type of packing was patented in 1913. It was a batch process. For what, what they did was loaded uh, a heavy fraction of crude oil into a pressurized vessel and then you know, hit the uh, hell out of it. And, and that's how they, uh, they produce a lot of products. But it had a major problem. Uh, uneven heating caused hot spots and, and that caused cook formation and the process was, was not that efficient, especially if the, the heavy fraction was very heavy. And the solution was a tube steel, which was invented by Edgar Clark, who was an operator at the refinery with a fourth grade education. And um, people claimed that was probably the uh, predecessor of the uh, fluid cracking process, uh, which was yet to come. And the tube steel was uh, designed to uh, increase or in improve heat transfer simply by increasing the surface area. Uh, and this tube seal was installed at the Wood River uh, Illinois refinery in 1914. In 1922, Burton was awarded the, uh, the Perkin Medal. And of course, Humphreys was not forgotten. He didn't get any medal, but he got a large amount of money. In 1924, 46 refineries licensed the Burton Humphreys thermal cracking process. That was that good. In 1925, uh, another major revolution happened when uh, Texaco introduced uh, <coughs> continuous feed thermal cracking. Uh, it's called the Holmes Manley process, which again, you know, uh, as another chapter in the, uh, in the history of the oil industry in this country. And in 1938, Whiting Labs invented the fluid catalytic cracking, which was actually the next revolution in petroleum processing. What uh, the catalytic cracking did uh, to petroleum industry is, you know, the effect is still, you know, visible. It made high octane gasoline. Not only uh, that was as good for uh, automobiles, uh, this was important for airplanes, especially in the Second World War. Uh, by this time, uh, about 50 percent of the crude could be converted into gasoline because of the, you know, cat cracking process. Uh, in 1944, uh, Standard Oil uh, installed the first ISOM unit at Whiting to produce aviation gasoline, again, uh, mainly to support the war efforts. Uh, Amoco had a, oh, I'm sorry, Standard Oil had a, uh, a, a tradition of innovation. Uh, they were constant, constantly inventing or reinventing things. Uh, Reforming technology to convert uh, saturated hydrocarbons into aromatics to raise octane was already there, but um, Amoco had invented a process uh, uh, that actually gave the highest octane content in the reformate. Uh, that is still being licensed uh, and being operated in a number of refineries worldwide. And in 1984, in the tradition of converting very heavy crudes into uh, light fuels, at the Texas City Refinery, uh, Standard Oil of Indiana commissioned nine huge reactors. Were the, at the time, the world's largest hydrocracking units. The purpose was to uh, uh, crack or hydrocrack heavy fractions from the very heavy Mexican crude. Uh, again, the incentive was that the the heavy Mexican crude was fairly cheap compared to uh, the average crude. And in the line of innovation, in 1993, this time it is Amico, invented the oats process. Uh, this was catalyzed by the need for producing low sulfur gasoline. As you know, the sulfur level in gasoline is going down. And this basically is um, a, a deviation from the traditional thermal or hydro processing of uh, petroleum fractions. This is real chemistry. What they did was, um, uh, our, uh, the, the infantasis process were able to 
increase or uh, 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 enhance the weight, molecular weight of sulfur-containing molecules by alkylation. And, and then this, you can uh, fractionate these heavy sulfur alkylates uh, and remove the sulfur. It's, it's being operated in two refineries in Europe, and uh, I believe two or three are being built at the moment. And by 1998, Amoco had five refineries in the US and processing about a million barrels of crude a day. And in 98, of course, you know, Amoco was merged with BP. That's about the refining side of things. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, marketing efforts by Standard of Indiana and followed by Amoco. Uh, I'm only going to touch upon certain uh, uh, salient features, uh, sometimes humorous. Uh, in 1911, uh, Amoco introduced, I'm sorry, Standard Oil, I keep saying Amoco, Standard Oil of Indiana, uh, introduced the first motorized truck deliver, uh, uh, delivering gasoline. Uh, th this was, in the old days, gasoline or fuel was, you know, distributed by horse-drawn ca uh, carts in, in vessels. Uh, sometimes the driver would be smoking like I remember on the, um, I have a picture of that, so I could get it here. Uh, and Standard of Indiana had a very aggressive marketing uh, program uh, in the Midwest. And uh, the, all the salesmen got Ford Roadsters, and incidentally, the. Uh, Standard of India was the largest Ford uh, customer at that time. And in World War I time, it supplied Taliban, obviously you know what Taliban would be used for, and also candles to the military. 285 million candles per year. I'm wondering what they used with, you know, what the use for candles was at that time. Uh, it was for, it was the only light source in the bunkers at that time. They didn't have batteries or, or fuel cells or anything like that. It was in high demand. And uh, supplied 55 tons of uh, sulfur per day from the Whiting refinery. And the Whiting um, laboratory was, uh, our machine shop was converted into a, uh, a factory for making washing parts at that time. Um, in 1915, <coughs> talking about product differentiation here, gas is not gas. The Amoco uh, oil company, the American oil company side of Standard Oil, introduced a clear high octane gasoline. That was the predecessor of the, what is now called the Amoco Ultimate Crystal Clear, some of you might know. And in 1917, uh, Standard introduced the first brick building for service stations. And there were brick pillars to protect the, uh, the gasoline pumps. And here's a picture of uh, the first gas station. It's a far cry from what you see these days. And there's mud in front of that station. Not very attractive sight. And as I go along, I'll show some small pictures of gas stations as they evolved uh, through the decades. And that might tell you about the changing architecture as well as uh, probably uh, the environmental impact. You can see uh, uh, probably Model T in the uh, in the forecourt over there uh, on the right hand side of the top. Um, the marketing operation of Standard uh, of Indiana was so huge, uh, it played very well in the stock market. In 1917, a single stock of Standard of Indiana sold for $945, and it earned $146 in dividends. I never heard about stock splitting in that time. In 1918, um, Standard of Indiana supplied gasoline to one third of the US population. It's mainly because it was operating in the Midwest as well as on the east side where most of the people were. And in 1931, uh, it introduced uh, three different octane grades for gasoline, which probably called now regular mid grade and premium. Um, and in 1950, uh, the, there was a company associated with Standard, which is called Red Crown uh, uh, Gasoline Company. They introduced White Crown Gasoline. It was purported as the best winter gasoline. 
and it was mostly sold in the uh, in the cold climates, uh, uh, the north uh, northern areas. And in 1960, they introduced a premium diesel, which at that time was the industry standard. And this had high cetane compared to normal uh, diesel, as well as very nice cold flow properties at that time. In 1963, introduced uh, carburetor jet, because you know, used carburetors at that time. I put this picture up here because the company was involved in lubricant sales as well, like most of the oil companies. And the interesting thing here is, notice at the very top, um, more into the scene of Custard's last tank, which basically oil companies were encouraging people to drive and consume fuel, which is not a good thing to do these days. And uh, of course, you know, this, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but um, there's a series of innovations in gasoline that um, Standard or Amoco did, uh, uh, including uh, removing, pioneering the removal of lead uh, from, the, uh, from gasoline, as well as working with the EPA to certify gasoline detergents for all grades of gasoline. And one significant thing I'd like to point out, uh, also the gentleman, Mr. Goldberg, is here. Uh, in 1992, Amoco introduced a premium gasoline. Uh, it's called the Crystal Clear, which is a distinct uh, product. The base fuel was made separately. Uh, it's Crystal Clear because it cut out the heavy ends that would eventually form deposits in fuel injectors and intake valves in the engine. And we also put a very uh, effective detergent additive in it, uh, so the performance will be uh, you know, superior. And also it had cold start and warm up uh, uh, advantages by adjusting the boiling uh, properties of this gasoline. So gasoline can be different. Uh, some of you might have seen in gas stations when you fill up, uh, the nozzle has a few holes around the tip of the uh, 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 it's, it's a special nozzle uh, for this, what is called the stage two recovery of vapor. Because when you fill gasoline, uh, uh, the, there's vapor inside the fuel tank in the automobile. It has to be uh, taken back according to the EPA rule. You cannot emit into the atmosphere. So uh, the, the nozzle that was invented by Amico uh, is a concentric piece where you put the gasoline through the middle uh, and then absorb the vapor from the fuel tank through these tiny holes on the outer side of the, the nozzle and send it back uh, to the uh, gasoline storage tank on the ground. That was a major discovery which Amoco gave to the industry free of charge, no licensing, and uh, uh, it's being used in, in, in very many uh, gas stations. Um, in 1995, also to cut down pollution in service stations, uh, Amoco invented a way to seal service station tanks. It's a major source of fugitive evaporation of hydrocarbons. And they were able to cut down evaporation almost to 100% by use of these special seals. Uh, I mentioned um, marketing. Part of marketing is transportation. Uh, Amoco owns or owned or co owned uh, uh, several major uh, pipelines. Uh, uh, one of the major uses was to transport their proprietary products like crystal clear gasoline. Uh, Amoco was not a big player in the international market. They had some minor operations in uh, Australia, Italy, Iran, UK, Egypt, and Trinidad. Uh, not much. Uh, at some point in you know, the early 80s, uh, 70s, they uh, got out of these places with uh, substantial profits and they found money, they sold it and got out. But then, uh, in the 90s, when uh, uh, international uh, markets were rising, uh, they went to the Far East and uh, to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and uh, exited all these markets in the late 90s with major losses. So, you know, sometimes America made the mistakes. <laughs> uh, these are some of the pictures of, I uh, compiled the uh, pictures of these gas stations. You can see, especially on the, the top, the gas stations were close to uh, uh, the residences of the owners. 
And usually in the, on the ground floor, there's a gas station on top of that people live, live with. So you don't see that anymore here. You can see the houses in, in some <coughs> of these pictures. And the middle, that's a white crown gasoline brand, which Standard owned uh, for a while. And uh, there's more, more pictures. I haven't put any most recent ones because you might have come across some of these. Besides, I didn't have good pictures of them either. In terms of oil exploration, uh, Amoco was uh, mainly a US operation. Uh, the, the global uh, business mostly lagged uh, majors, like they couldn't compete with uh, Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, or BP, or Shell. So they just stayed uh, in the US side. Um, Pan American was very active in uh, uh, overseas, but eventually uh, uh, Colonel Stewart sold uh, part of the Pan American sessions back to, uh, to a standard of New Jersey, uh, which was owned by Rockefeller at that time. Incidentally, one little fact is that during this sale, there was a stock exchange or stock swap process. Uh, Standard of Indiana was the major owner of Standard of New Jersey, which Rockefeller really didn't like, so he somehow managed to buy everything back. Um, uh, one of the things about exploration that I like to mention is the uh, uh, invention of what is called coherence cube technology for detailed analysis of 3D seismic data. This was uh, co-developed by Amico and some other partners, which actually uh, improved oil exploration process. Uh, in other words, cut down the number of dry holes or dry wells later on. And um, uh, they're also uh, you know, pretty active in uh, uh, natural gas and natural gas production. That's about it. Uh, I can uh, answer a couple of questions on the oil side before I turn it over to uh, Don. Good questions. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Don Hanneman. I was uh, formerly in my prior life a director of research for Amoco Chemicals, and I lived through most of the history which I'm going to describe here since uh, Amoco Chemicals was a much younger, smaller company uh, than Amoco Corporation. Uh, <clears throat> this is the outline I'll follow. Uh, like uh, Joe, I'll go through the genealogy, then a quick overview of the business history, and then uh, talk about some key technical developments which might surprise some of you. And uh, finally, a look at the mature company. Uh, again, there are some aspects of that which may be surprising to some of you. Looking at the genealogy, the company was born in uh, 1945, the fall of 1945. At that point, uh, few would have believed that in a short span of about 50 years, that company formed by the consolidation of these six small companies listed there uh, would grow into one of the uh, top ten chemical companies in the United States. But that's exactly what did happen. Uh, there was a character change that occurred in 1957, uh, mainly because the sales of uh, chemicals from refineries had uh, grown to about $20 million per year, and the company decided to consolidate all of their chemical assets uh, and their operations and research under the name of Amical Chemicals. There was a slight change in the character in 1988 when the company decided to remove the S from chemicals and it became Amical Chemical Company, which it retained uh, for the remainder of its life. Uh, as uh, a change in name, there were also, oops, go back just there a second, there were a change in logos, the first which appeared uh, in 1957 at the first sales meeting, uh, and then uh, the changes through 1960, 1970, and 1972. Uh, we found in, next one, 
we found in uh, going uh, through the history that it would be uh, simplest to uh, segment it into decades. And uh, I think you'll see why as we move along. In, uh, in the 1940s, uh, we, as we said, it was incorporated in 45. And the operations were mainly at the three refineries, Wood River, Whiting, and Texas City, because what was being sold were the products listed here. Uh, however, by the 1950s, things again began to change. Uh, Amoco acquired its first standalone chemical plant in 1954 from Carthage Hydrocall. It was a uh, plant designed primarily to uh, generate products from natural gas. Uh, that plant proved to be a technical success, but an economic failure because of price changes in natural gas. One of the biggest events that occurred in the 50s uh, was the acquisition of MC Corporation, or Mid-Century Corporation. Uh, with them came the MC technology for the oxidation of hydrocarbons. And as you will see, that was the most significant event in the Young Chemical Company's history. In 1959, uh, Amoco uh, commercialized that MC technology and opened its first aromatics acids plant at Joliet, Illinois, uh, producing the five products shown. The next four decades, we found, would be almost impossible to uh, categorize year by year. So what we chose to do was to take these four decades and look at the tactics that were used by Amoco Chemical to establish themselves as a world-scale chemical company. We'll talk about these sequentially, but it doesn't mean to imply that uh, they happen sequentially uh, or they even happen sequentially within a decade. So moving on, uh, first to the establishment of some core commodity chemical and polymers lines. In the 60s, uh, as I had mentioned, purified terephthalic acid, and I'll be using some acronyms here, and I've got them listed in parentheses. Uh, PTA became a very prominent product. It didn't start out that way because the first aromatics acids plant from Joliet produced a range of products the one that went into polyesters was dimethyl terephthalate, uh, but uh, Amoco uh, had decided that that was not the best route to go, and they embarked on a development of a PTA process, or a process for purifying terephthalic acid. And that gave them its major boost in the chemical industry, because not only did PTA give them a lot of sales, it shaped the polyester industry for the future. In the 70s, they moved into uh, polymers with high-density polyethylene and polypropylene. They also entered the olefins business uh, with some olefins units in, in a new site at Chocolate Bio, Texas. Their PTA business had also expanded so much that new sites were opened in the 60s. In the 60s, at Decatur, Alabama, and another major site in the 70s, in uh, Cooper River, South Carolina. That site uh, was the home of the first uh, billion pound per year chemical plant, as far as I know, in the, uh, in the world, because uh, Amoco had tried to produce a, or to use or construct, I should say, a billion pound per year plant uh, earlier on and had not been successful. That was, I believe, an ammonia plant. Next, we'll move on to the establishment of a specialty chemical and polymer lines. The company saw that uh, once it had established some commodity chemical base, that there were higher margins to be realized by moving into specialty chemicals. Uh, this started in the 60s with uh, purified isothalic acid and uh, the other two products, trimolytic and hyride and poly. Uh, or trimolytic anhydride that's listed there were both products uh, from the plant at uh, Joliet, Illinois. Uh, that was followed uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s by a range of other specialty 
products, including uh, metazylene in the 70s, malic anhydride, and MTBE in the 80s, and into the 90s, uh, 2,6-NDA. They then forward uh, talk, or looked into forward integration into downstream products. Again, this was looking at profit margins. And uh, probably the ones that should be mentioned here uh, and given the most attention are the woven polypropylene fabrics and yarns. Uh, they got into this business, and we'll talk about this just a few minutes from now, with the acquisition of Abison and Patchogue Plymouth. Uh, again, what should be mentioned here is uh, polyethylene terephthalate bottles. Or these were based, again, on PTA. Uh, what's significant about this particular entry is that Amoco's bottles were the first to be approved by the soft drink industry. This came about uh, from a very close working relationship with PepsiCo Corporation. Uh, the PET, can, PET containers became po profitable and very popular in the 80s for the packaging of a large number of other household items and food items. Diversification was another means of attaining the goal of a goal, becoming, a global, uh, <coughs> becoming a global company. In the 1960s, they were involved in engineering plastics, or engineered plastics. You may remember the name Torlon, which was their entry into the engineered plastics uh, business. That particular polymer was uh, initially used to produce an all-polymer automobile engine. It never proved to be uh, accepted by the industry, but it, it did uh, perform and it was used in a racing car application. In the 1980s, uh, they moved into a whole series of engineering polymers and composites and also into a series of other businesses which included solar cells, laser, biotechnology, electronics, and artificial intelligence. Uh, the reason those are listed here uh, is that Amico Chemical to a certain extent was the initial sponsor of many of these projects and many uh, of the uh, scientists at Amical Chemicals performed some of the initial research work that was done in these areas. Ultimately, those emerging technologies became part of Amical Technology Company. Then there were some strategic uh, acquisitions. Uh, I have already mentioned Mincetri Corporation, and I've mentioned Avison and Patchogue Plymouth. But these are the ones that I think require the most attention because they brought with it technologies that Amoco, uh, again, demonstrated their ability to innovate and commercialize. Uh, the hydrocarbon oxidation not only gave them PTA, it gave them uh, PIA, the uh, purified isothalic acid, trimelitic anhydride, and ultimately uh, in the 90s, 2,6-NDA. Uh, with Avison uh, came along a, a competitive polypropylene process, and uh, with Patchogue Plymouth came along the capabilities uh, to produce uh, woven uh, fabrics uh, from polypropylene. And finally, uh, there was globalization. Uh, Amoco uh, was into uh, the uh, globalization effort very early. Uh, they opened a wholly owned uh, TA, PTA, and DMT unit at Gale, Belgium as early as 1969. And in the 1970s, uh, they became very active in licensing their TA, PTA technology and that was one of the tactics they used to accomplish two things. One, it established PTA as the primary product for the production of polyethylene terephthalate, and it established Amical Chemical uh, as a player in the European and Far East marketplace. <clears throat> in the 1990s, uh, they had a, a whole variety of joint ventures appearing in Malaysia, Indonesia, 
China, Japan, Singapore. To digress just briefly, I wanted to show you uh, some uh, photos of the primary plant sites uh, in the United States and in Europe. This one is uh, Cooper River, South Carolina, which opened in 1971. Decatur, Alabama opened in 1966. Chocolate Bio opened in 1971. And this is Joliet in Texas City. Texas City uh, actually was in operation in 1965. And Joliet, as I mentioned, was opened in 1959. And finally, uh, we have a uh, shot of our Gale Belgium plant, as I mentioned, was opened up in 1969. Uh, next, we'll move on to major technical achievements. Uh, many times when you're part of a very large corporation, uh, you don't get much recognition for technical achievements, especially if they're chemical process uh, rather than chemical product related. Uh, but what should be noted here is that more than 1,900 U.S. patents were granted from the period 1957 to 1998. Uh, in the aromatics acids area, of course, purified terephthalic acid stands out. Uh, and it was a U.S. patent granted to uh, a chemist uh, at the uh, Whiting Research Laboratory at the time, an individual by the name of uh, Delbert Meyer. But along with that came uh, later on uh, some patents for second generation uh, xylene isomerization, paraxylene separation processes, which ensured that the company had a, always had a ready supply of uh, aromatic hydrocarbon feedstocks and also positioned them as a leading merchant supplier of these feedstocks. We move on to a second uh, slide showing some additional technologies invented, developed, and commercialized in polymers, polymer products, and in waste treating. The ones that stand out, of course, are the uh, propylene process, uh, where it may not be too well known, but uh, Amico uh, did, uh, was finally awarded a uh, composition of matter patent for crystalline polypropylene uh, for work done as early as 1954. That patent was not granted uh, uh, only until much later, uh, and there was much litigation that went on between Amico and another company about who really did do the uh, basic work for the composition of matter. But the important thing was uh, in polypropylene was the gas phase uh, patent. Uh, it was originally uh, commercialized in polyethylene, but very quickly converted to uh, polypropylene, the polypropylene process, and Amico was the first to implement a gas phase polypropylene pro process in the United States. Uh, in the polymer products area, I think what needs to be noted are the PET containers because that not only provided a very large volume outlet for polyethylene terephthalene, but also established uh, the PET containers uh, as uh, suitable for a very wide range of applications. In waste treating, uh, little is known about uh, the anaerobic digestion process, but this process was developed by Amico Chemical in order to treat its PTA plant waste streams. Uh, it was unique enough uh, to gain the Kirkpatrick Award in 1991 uh, for engineering excellence. Next we move on to technologies that were acquired but then developed and commercialized. We'll just move quickly through here, but they, I should point out they again illustrate the unique capabilities of uh, Amico to optimize and commercialize. Uh, we've already talked about the aromatics acids uh, that uh, gave them the position in terephthalic acid, but there were others. Uh, that were the malic anhydride process that they commercialized was the first to use butene as a feedstock. Uh, they also were very, uh, in the olefins area, they were the first uh, producer to use a fundamental mathematical model to optimize uh, pyrolysis furnace operation. 
And then the polymers area, I've already mentioned, the gas phase polypropylene process, but one that's little known is that a polystyrene process, a mass polymerization process, was first made continuous by uh, Amico. This was done in the uh, mid to uh, early 60s. Again, we move on to uh, polymer products. Uh, uh, the uh, polypropylene carpet backing and uh, fiber and yarn stand out. Uh, what started out to be primarily polypropylene used as carpet backing ended up uh, as much broader application of polypropylene. And uh, it's, it's very, very uh, difficult to see an application that doesn't use polypropylene uh, carpet or uh, fabrics or yarn. <clears throat> and I have specialty products up there. Again, maybe, again, I should emphasize that these no longer are, are part of Amical Chemical and were for very long a part of Amical Chemical. They ultimately became under the umbrella of Amical Technology Company. But I show them here mainly to illustrate the extent that Amico Corporation went uh, to identify emerging technologies which might prove to be opportunities for future growth. And now we'll just move on to the uh, mature company. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on these slides. Uh, what we have here is a list first of the of six hydrocarbon feedstocks which uh, were in products at the time Amico merged with BP. And then we move on to some chemical intermediates. There's six of those which were major products of Amico Chemical again at the end of 1997. And finally, looking at uh, polymers, there are five categories of polymers of which Amico was a producer at the end of 1997. Uh, and the, again, I list the emerging technologies. Finally, we'll take a look at the mature company. It shows all the characteristics uh, of a major international chemical company. And this is what the goal was at the time the company originally was formed. As you can see, it ranked number six in the United States in revenue with uh, over $5.9 billion in sales. It had over 48,000 employees, and it had <clears throat> manufacturing sites shown there. 11 of them within the United States, five joint ventures in 16 countries. And it was the large, world's largest manufacturer of the list of commodity chemicals shown here. And the second largest, in linear alpha olefins, a leader, leading manufacturer of polypropylene, and a leading manufacturer of polypropylene carpet backing, industrial fabrics, and yarn. It had indeed become a major international oil company, or chemical company. And uh, we'll, I'll show you here just a few slides of the products that uh, either contain directly the products from Amico Chemical, or they are PTA-based or have chemical intermediates that were part of Amico Chemical. Uh, all the way from automotive bumpers to uh, <clears throat> the, uh, these are PET containers uh, used for foodstuffs and for detergents. Uh, moving on to the next, uh, inline skates and uh, pool liners that are polypropylene. Up in the right-hand corner are uh, some wire coatings and cable coatings, uh, some of them using uh, trimolytic anhydride. And as we move on uh, to the next slide, we have on the left-hand uh, polyester uh, bottles, some recording tape, and uh, of course we can't overlook polyester fabrics. And uh, right below it, the dark colored product is carpet backing, polypropylene carpet backing. Upper right hand corner is a coffee maker with a polypropylene casing. Moving on to the next, uh, we have a food processor. Uh, again, that's polycarbonate. 
And on the right, there are some flexible uh, polypropylene, uh, no, that's a pair of polyethylene terephthalate packaging for foodstuffs. And uh, some hydrodermic uh, syringes for the medical profession. And again, clear PET bottles uh, for water. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, these uh, current and former employees for providing some significant input. Uh, there's a couple on there in particular. Uh, one is Bill Kennel. Uh, he's listed uh, third down on the left, who was the individual, ultimately a vice president of Amical Chemical, but he was the one uh, that identified the uh, MC technology is one that the company should acquire and has insisted that the company purchase that technology. Without that insight, uh, the company would not have been uh, what it became. And there's a whole list of other people who did provide a lot of input, but I wanted to mention uh, Bill's name. He never became a president of the company, but he certainly did make a significant contribution. Uh, thanks a lot. I think Joe thanks you too for listening to this short history. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them for you. Okay, thank you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.